And a very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Issues and Attitudes. My name is Jeff Owens, and our manager at WEIU. Today we're going to talk all things EIU sports with the EIU Director of Athletics, Mr. Tom Michael. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Sports Information Assistant uh, sure, Athletic Director Rich Moser, whatever one want to use today. <laughs> yes, very much so. Thank man you, of, Man of all trades. Well, thanks for coming in, guys. I know we're getting ready to get into the real busy season, so I thought we'd have you guys in and talk about sports instead of all the other things that are going on in our tumultuous world, even though we'll probably touch a little bit on COVID just because we have to. But fall sports are, you know, really starting right now. So, Tom, do you mind giving us, like, an overview of what we can expect for the fall here on campus? Yeah, I, th- I think we're, we're all really excited, um, certainly to to, to be able to to have games, um, you know, football had a scrimmage last night. We're less than two weeks away from them opening up. Um, women's soccer had a scrimmage, an exhibition match. Close. Uh, y- yes, <laughs> yesterday. <Poor part> yesterday, <laughs> uh, men's soccer is up at Northwestern today in exhibition. Uh, Cross country is going to report this week. Volleyball's been here for a week and a half now, um, so it's it's cranking up. And then obviously class is starting, so um, campus is starting to liven up a little bit with more more folks around, and certainly our students athletes are part of that population but we're excited to be in the position where where we're playing and we're planning on and everything like that um, especially what we've been going through the last 18 months here sure. speaking of volleyball I mean I was on vacation I read the press release and I did the double check and I'm sure you had the Beach Volleyball, which is a part of the OBC already, right, yeah. is coming to EIU this spring. Can you tell us about it and how that came about? Yeah, we've been we've been really talking about it for probably uh, five or six months. Uh, and, you know, with the OBC already sponsoring it, um, you know, I, I, when I talked to Sarah about it initially, I, I said, if we're going to do something like this, I wanted to make sure that we're going to help our court team. Um, and if we felt like we were falling behind because other people had had beach and we didn't, then that's something that we needed to look into. So, um, Moorhead State, uh, Austin P, and UT Martin are are three that have it and have been. Um, I think we've seen a noticeable improvement on their court play. Uh, and Sarah and I talked about it and sat down with Dr. Glassman and looked at it. We're not adding any scholarships. Uh, we're not adding any staff or anything like that the the court kids will be playing beach in the in the spring and and sarah manolo will manolo is actually going to be the head beach coach um they'll be uh running it from that perspective so um there's no additional cost um with it from that perspective and we think it's going to really give us an opportunity to be better on the court in the fall and i heard you get to play in the community not on campus so that's kind of another way you can reach into the, in the city of charleston is that correct yeah uh sarah manolo have worked with the city of charleston and they've been um extremely helpful um, uh, they've got some sand courts at Sister City Park, and and I think they're in good shape. And Sarah Manolo think we can train out there when we need to. So it's a good relationship. And, and as you said, Jeff, if we can continue to engage the community and what we're doing in that regard and continue to develop that relationship uh, with the community, I think that just helps everybody. I don't know that much about volleyball or beach volleyball, but when it comes to recruiting, does this help now that when you can all, you tell a kid that they can play both or, or have the opportunity to play both? Yeah, I think that's what the expectation would be. Okay. Is is um, you know obviously there's not a lot of beach volleyball played um, <laughs> here in Central Illinois, but but as you continue, you know we just don't recruit Central Illinois. We're recruiting all over the place, and and I think Sarah has really expanded the roster from from that perspective. So I think it gives them an additional piece to that because. I think it's twofold is is it's going to help develop your game because you're playing two on two so you're going to have to improve your ball handling skills whether you're a outside or or you're a libero whatever that might be um, but then it also gives an opportunity there's there's a lot of beach play after college and so to get that experience I think only helps too and it came off the women just winning the gold in beach volleyball over the Tokyo which those two got a lot a lot of press time and coverage so that was kind of it's kind of it was a, a neat time for you to announce it yeah Rich did a great job picking the timing did to you put that, that press release sure. out. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's a popularity piece with that, too, and, and hopefully we can we can get a bounce off of that. And, you know, um, again, um, trying to move forward with it uh, in a way that it helps our court our court play, too. And they will play this spring, right? Spring yes. 22. So yep. I, n- yep. there's no waiting around for that one, so that'll be kind of interesting. Uh, you had a big uh, golf outing this past weekend. Heard a lot of people talking about it. Had a good time. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about That's the final one of the three, right, as we prepare for the fall? Yeah, that's the final one of the three. Uh, Mike Murray, who's our associate AD for development, he kind of came in and took those over. We, we traditionally have done one in Charleston and in Matt and or Mattoon this year we did both and then we expanded down into Effingham this year and people that were in Effingham they would tell you that you know about halfway through you needed Noah's Ark to get to get <laughs> through I mean it was probably the most rain I've ever seen 
at, at a golf outing in a short period of time, but the, the weather was, was good. We had, what, I think 26 or 27 teams out there, and it's it's always good when we're able to get out in the community and be able to see those people that, that support us and really in a, in a different environment. It's, it's great to see them come to games and support us, but you're able to see them in a, in a different manner there, and I, and I think they had a good time. And I like the fact that you guys, you do so much with social media and the pictures, and I was looking at some of the pictures over the weekend of the golf, and you get all the foursomes and people having fun. I think that's neat. It really shows you're being out there, and I think social media has helped. And look like, and I saw a lot of my friends who obviously didn't work Friday were on the <laughs> golf course. So that's cool. Uh, the big thing, obviously, we're, since we're the flagship for EIU football, EIU football is uh, starting in just a couple of weeks, Indiana State. Uh, talk about what we can expect as we look into the fall football season here at EIU. Well, I think I think the word maybe that that comes up for me at least is we're really optimistic. Uh, you know, it's been a it's been a challenging year not playing in the fall, but we played in the spring, and now the turnaround has been a little bit quicker. But but I think the transfer portal, um, good, bad, or indifferent, I think it it probably helped us um, this year on the football uh, on the football side, and we were able to add some kids that are going to make a difference. Um, I think our line got bigger through that process too, and so I think there's there's optimism that um, Adams' first year we weren't real competitive on the field, and and last year we won one ball game but we were in um i think three others three of the other four um late in the game were were uh into the fourth quarter were a uh, touchdown away with jacksonville state um you know and they go into the playoffs win a game in the playoffs and such so i think there's i think there's uh, a lot of encouragement as we go into the into the fall and and think that we can win some ball games and that's the big thing is if, can we finish and and learn how to win and rich everything is back to normal so you can the ticket packages promotions game day uh, any rules or COVID or just we're just going into it like the old times, uh, which, which we hope. <laughs> well, right now, right now that that's our hope, and we're, I mean our our approach, and I think you've seen it with a lot of the advertising for different things. We just started sending out some of our, our radio advertising, so people will hear those on, on the radio talking about trying to get people to to come back. We know two years ago it was Adam's first year. I think we had had some good crowds and people were missed the opportunity to see maybe the growth of the program last year and so a lot of times when we're talking about it it's Tom and I were a lot of times the only two people that sometimes saw road games you know I mean in fact I know when Mike and Jack, when they did a game last year at Tennessee State, they did it for Mike's basement because they weren't even allowed to, to have radio go on the road. Yeah. That's how different it was. It, it's going to be, you, you try to tell people, it's back to the way it used to be And in terms of we should have fans there. We don't know what COVID policies are going to be. You know, with the Delta variant right now, I think things change day to day. But from an outdoor standpoint, the CDC, Eastern, the local health department has said that, you know, everything is kind of normal we just kind of will think people will want to be careful when they come but we're expecting to have tailgating and expecting to have nice crowds and you know on september 18th when we play against illinois state under the lights we're expecting to have a nice big crowd there speaking of, i was going to ask you next you talk about some of the maybe the home highlights this year and, and when is that the first home game the illinois state game? it is yeah and unfortunately okay. there's not a lot of games to highlight unfortunately uh two members in our league decided that they didn't no longer wanted to be part of the league and with that we had to, to shift around the schedule in the ovc and we went from having the traditional five games that we would have, which were four of those would have been conference, then the non-conference game to we were only left with three conference games. Three of them are great times of the year. You're going to have your September 18th game against Illinois State under the lights. We think that people will be excited about that. Always a regional rivalry there. And then we're going to have back-to-back games in mid-October and mid-October weather. And, and Charleston's usually very cooperative. We'll have um, Hall of Fame on October 16th, and then we'll have homecoming on October 23rd. Uh, unique for us is we're going to have back two home co- two Hall of Fame classes being inducted the same year. We we announced a class in 2020, but we're not able to induct them. So now we will induct both of those. So we're hoping that'll be an excitement. And then the for homecoming, we're playing Tennessee State and. They're getting a little bit of buzz from the fact that Eddie George and people that follow <laughs> NFL will know that. So Eddie George Good is bringing man. bringing his show here. So, I mean, hopefully it, it'll be you know that'll be smash mouth football. We we know they're going to run the football. We we think from what we've seen from Adam that they've gotten more big and physical and that we're going to run the football and 
that should be an exciting football game to watch. So the three-game ticket package is available, I assume. And then, there, then the, the final game of the year against Murray State in November, but those three would be, when you ask about highlights, those would be the three that we're okay. really pushing. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you hit on something I, I want to talk with, uh, to, to Tom about, is the OVC went through some changes, like you know, it, like it's going on all, all over co co football right now, or just college sports right now, with Jacksonville State and Eastern Kentucky leaving, where does the OVC, are they looking to add, or are they thinking about it? And I know everything kind of shifts day to day or month to month, it seems like. Yeah, and, and I think you're exactly right, Jeff. It, it continues to ebb and flow through that process. Uh, you know, it's it's not it's not like on June 30th we were just informed that they were going to be leaving. Um, we've known that for a few months, so there's been a lot of conversations, um, some at the AD level, um, some at the presidential level, about what that looks like. We're a 10-member league right now. I think the difficulty becomes that we're a seven-member football playing conference right now. So, so I think um, certainly as we as we look to build out our football schedules, um, getting getting an additional one or two um, football playing schools, whether that's just as an affiliate member or full members, we're not sure yet. But I would like to think that there's going to be some movement sometime early this fall in terms of um, extending an invitation to someone or, or something like that to try to expand where we're at. But but I think, you know, for the most part, we feel good with a 10-member league, but I think everybody would feel a lot more confident if we had 12. I understand. Um, speaking of that, these the the super conferences are what they're talking about. If Oklahoma and Texas go to the SEC and if Kansas goes to the Big Ten, all the stuff that we, we hear every day now, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, you've been around college sports a long time, so have you, Rich, and I want your opinion, too. Um, where it looks like we're heading. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think it, it's clearly going to look a lot different five years from now, and I'm not – I'm not sure that's good for college athletics uh, as a whole. Um, you know, there there continues to be a widening of the gap um, between the haves and have-nots. I think in this conversation with Texas and Oklahoma, uh, the president of the University of Texas indicated that their athletic budget was going to be about $220 million. Um, I mean, that's that's phenomenal um, to have a athletic department budget like that, and and so you know, it, I think it's gonna, I think it's really going to be interesting to see what happens with the power fives and and then where does that how does that trickle down That's you know there's there's some speculation do they do they break away from the NCA um, do they create their own their own deal they're getting closer and closer um, to uh, to the professional semi-pro um, aspect and and maybe the NCA isn't isn't fit to be in its place anymore maybe maybe that whole rule book needs to be rewritten um, where it's going but but I think there's a lot of things that have accelerated that process and certainly name image and likeness has done it the one-time transfer piece has done it COVID probably um, the timing of it has helped accelerate a lot of these things to move forward did you anything I, I would agree with that I, I would say that it's interesting that a lot of those decisions I think sometimes are being made by the football component of that and you look at the way the NCAA is, is modeled is the men's basketball tournament and the teams that have the ability to play in that, and there's about 365, 370 Division One teams that generate so much money that then facilitates finances to come to schools like Eastern Illinois, schools in the OVC. If you were to have that shift in power and those schools break away, they're going to have to look at how those models work for them too. You know. All of a sudden, if you're a coach of, let's say, the women's tennis team at one of those at Alabama, is this a good thing for you that we break away and really become a, like Tom said, a semi-pro football league or semi-pro basketball league? And th th it's going to be an interesting dynamic on how it shakes out for the NCAA, but even within those, I think, those internal departments at those big schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this year might be the buffer year, and every year just keeps changing maybe. Uh, and you, sp you spoke on the NLI, the name, likeness, and image. I mean, how does that... Is that is that a factor here at Eastern? It, will any, is or do we have athletes that may qualify into that, and maybe a a sponsor wants to come, or is or is it not down here yet? Oh no, I think I think that we've got some folks that that are engaging in some of those activities. It's it's not the uh, gymnast from LSU that potentially is getting between a four and five million dollar <laughs> deal. You know, we don't have those things, um, but we have some kids that that are taking advantage of of that opportunity to be able to um, to benefit fit from that. Uh, I think what you're going to see, Jeff, you mentioned, you know, uh, 
uh, Rich and, and Sandy King and, and his group, how active they are on social media. I think that's really where you're going to ultimately see a lot of these things take place is, is, is those student athletes that come into programs, whether it's at Eastern Illinois or LSU or whomever it might be, is those folks that have large followings on social media are going to have opportunities that, that are unique to them um, by their postings. And, and um, you know, they've gotten those large followings by doing a variety of things and and things like that. So, um, you know, it, it's here, and we're aware of it. We're dealing with it. It certainly has created a little bit more work for our compliance office, um, but um, just trying to manage and make sure our student-athletes are, are staying within the guardrails of, of what's in place. They're pretty wide, um, but um, but still stay within it so, they don't affect, so it they, doesn't affect their eligibility. They can't really have EIU on anything, correct? Correct. But they can have, like, the blue and gray and or the blue and black. And yep. The color schemes can be correct, but if they want to do their own T-shirts or posters, yep. they can sell them. So. That's right. I get it. Um, also, I, and this is more of a thank you, but I also want to acknowledge the fact that Eastern Illinois and the and the athletic department is allowing Matt Toon uh, to play our, our, I say our because I've got a kid there and I help with the huddle, but uh, our, still, and I'm from Matt Toon, to play our home games on your field. I want to thank you, but uh, your thoughts on the process. I mean, it's still, it, it takes time and effort and a little bit of wear and tear to do those things. Yeah, I think when, when it initially came to us, um, you know, we just wanted to make sure that what kind of impact would it have for us on, on Saturday. Saturdays and and when it came out that that wasn't really going to be a problem for us it was really an easy decision um, they're they're getting upgrades to their field and and their football facility and and they need a place to go and um, I, I, I hope that that it reflects that um, that our communities want to be partners with each other I've said since I've came here seven years ago now um, going into my eighth year that that we need all of Coles County to to be a part of what we're trying to do and not just Charleston, but we need Matt Toon, and if we can be a good partner with them when, when they need some some assistance like they do right now with the facility, I think it's it's the thing that we should be doing. Cool. Anything you want to add, Rich? I would just say on that, I mean, we're, we're happy to have that. I know Dave Veith has been a great partner over there, the AD at, at Matt Toon. I know he's in his last year there, and so I think... <laughs> so, good the, shots so this was yeah. good for him, I think, that we were able to, to help them out, and you guys... Uh, be able to have a place to play for the fall. I appreciate that. Um, how cool was it when you saw Trey Sweeney's name go to the Yankees in the first round? A couple, by, seems like a couple weeks ago. It's been a few weeks ago. Both of you can ask that. And he's doing really well. He has another home run last night in the minors. So, yeah, I, I think you're. You know, when you when you Jason mentions that, hey, he's been invited to go out to Denver. I think is where they where they shot that, and he's only one of X number. You think, oh my gosh, that's that's really impressive. So you're you're sitting on pins and needles watching that that whole draft board and. And then, and then when he comes up to go to the Yankees, it's just, it's it's incredible for Trey. It's incredible for our program. It's incredible for Jason and his staff to be able to to do that. And then I think the publicity that Eastern Illinois University received from that through ESPN, I, I think, only helps too. So, uh, you know, and and I would just I would just add that Trey is an unbelievable kid. Uh, you know, he's academic all American. Um, he's he's everything that that you want your poster you know student athlete to be trey is that and you know um the success will follow when you do things like that and certainly certainly very happy and and um thrilled for trey to be in that position and to go to the yankees too i mean uh, not, yeah. not to disparage other teams but i mean they're a premier you know team premier sports team not just a baseball team a premier sports team in america yeah i would i would kind of cycle it similar to you know not that he was drafted by him but when tony went and played Quarterback for the Cowboys. Tony Romo for those. There, there, be, there become <laughs> there becomes positions with teams that you know yeah. a player becomes synonymous with. Playing shortstop for the Yankees is one of those. I don't know that Trey's going to be a shortstop. It sounds like from talking to Jason that the, the Yankees may already have three or four shortstops ahead of him. But Trey's a versatile enough kid that they can move him to the outfield. They can move him. They to always third find base. a place for those guys to yes. play. <laughs> and, Left-handed and it, hitters. <laughs> and, it, and it was good. I mean, it was interesting. We we watched all year with us. With COVID, we weren't able to have a lot of fans, but scouts were able to come, and it would be interesting. You would come, and you would see them, and, and you can kind of tell who they're watching, and you'd have 20 or 21 scouts, and all of a sudden, they've got the gun when Trey's swinging, and then all of a sudden, all the guns go down after Trey. <laughs> you always feel bad for the next kid that comes up after after the kid that's being recruited, <laughs> and we had, you'd see that, and it, and it wasn't just for, hey, one game. It was game after game after game, scouts were coming, and then the regional cross-checkers come, and then we're starting to see things at the end of the year that, you know, they're talking about maybe a top five round draft pick. And now it's maybe top two rounds. And then 
I I thought in the I saw a lot of things in the first round. The Yankees would not have been the team I ever saw him associated with. So, you know, great for him. I, I don't know that. Never Trey's never going to say that the Yankees weren't his dream team. Now I don't know that that was, you know, the team growing up for. But I, I think if you're a little kid, that's one of the teams that you would always, you know, if you're fantasizing, that's one of the teams yeah. you want to be drafted by. Yeah, you yeah, could make money in many different ways there. If you, <laughs> well, and I think that. Jeff, it's pretty cool too that you know it's with Jason, Jason pitched yeah, in Yankee yeah, Stadium, Yankee. you know, and so that little connection, albeit it's small, I think is is a pretty good connection for EIU too. There you go. Uh, we had Marty Simmons on a few weeks <laughs> a, a few weeks ago talking basketball. And if you heard it or not, but uh, we'll get to that later on. But uh, you know, we're t- we had a little contest whether who could outshoot each other, and so. Uh, but you know, what, what your thoughts on Marty Simmons? That's a it's a it's a, a big name coming to Eastern uh, to uh, you know to get our basketball program uh, in the right direction. Not that it wasn't going, but you know what I'm talking about. I mean, so how excited are you about Marty and Doug and the and the staff? Yeah, I think I think the piece, uh, kind of the the icing on the cake, was the fact that Marty had a name here, uh, a local guy. I think you know that wasn't certainly um, one of the priorities we set forth when we when we got into that search. Um, we really wanted somebody that could do a great job recruiting um, that we needed to understand who EIU was, who we are, um, and make sure that we can develop talent when we get here. I wanted somebody that's going to play hard and, and really hard-nosed defense and have some structure on the offensive end to where we can really um, have a purpose when we play. Um, you know, and, and I think uh, Marty's 13 years at, at Evansville, not a highly resourced program either, and he had a lot of success um, there. And obviously, um, as you mentioned, the icing on the cake was that Marty played a ton of super sectional games here, played a ton of <laughs> holiday tournament games here, he and Doug both. And, and being an hour and 15 minutes away, um, their name is, is very familiar in the area, and, and I hope... I hope that basketball fans in the area recognize that our program is going to be different with Marty leading it, and and hopefully it's going to be an exciting year. We've we've certainly got a new roster. Um, the transfer portal um, probably um, well, there's no question it changed the look of our team. Um, I think we've got a great group of guys that have come in and and they bought into who Marty is, what his expectations are, the level and effort that they're going to be required to play at every day in practice and on the games, and, and I think it's going to be a really fun product uh, for our fans to watch and engage with and um, you know obviously hopefully we can win a lot of ball games. Well when he was here I, you know I didn't, I'd never met him before and he, he was very motivational he, he made you want to go out and play basketball yeah. then. You know, he just comes across as here's what I'm going to do I've got my game plan and you're going to like the product. So I think what you said is uh, that people need to come out and, and if they get a chance to hear him speak at a, at a dinner or speak, I think they'll be motivated as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's I think it's great for our basketball program uh, to move forward with and and um, you know it's uh, there's a little, there's the Lawrenceville connection there with he and Doug and they won a lot of basketball games down there and um, you know if if they can bring any of that uh, Lawrenceville magic um, back to Lance, then we'll be in good shape. <laughs> well, thank you, right? Um, Rich, I want to talk to you a little bit. I, a few years ago, uh, you guys have great looking shirts on, by the way. But <laughs> yeah, you incorporated the new logo mm-hmm. um, and the branding. And, and, and how is give us what you, the thoughts on it so far? And is it financially re- re- are we re- receiving the rewards you thought? But just uh, when people when you go across the country playing these other schools, do they li- do they they like the new Panther logo? I think they do. I, I, I'll let, Tom will have to answer on the, the financial part. He sees that <laughs> I, 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 not so much. I know that's through the collegiate licensing. I think anytime you change your branding, there, there's going to be you know some positive and negative energy that comes around that, and also you know everybody's going to have to buy the new gear if they want to have that. So I, I think from that standpoint, I think it identifies more with what our school colors are, which are the blue, the gray, the white. I think so that from that perspective, the, the logo identifies more. I think as people see it, they get used to it, and the first year, it, it was drastically different than what we had had before. So I think it took people time to see that. Now, if I look at the old logo, and it, it's so different and seems so dated, this seems so modern now, and, and, I, and I think that was the thought process, but I, I know change is sometimes hard for people, especially when they've they become ingrained in what they they've always always had and always seen. And but you see that new Panther everywhere. I mean, I think more younger people are wearing it, so it's working there. Yeah, I think to Rich's point, it it modernized a little bit of who we were and 
and uh, I just echo what Rich said. You know, there's there's some traditionalists that still would like the Strutting Panther um, to to be back, and 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 I get that and understand that and and appreciate it. And not that we're doing away with any of the history piece of it, but we just move forward with it. And I and I think for the most part, Jeff, it's been a, a really good thing for for the athletic department, hopefully for the institution, and certainly for our student athletes. Now you've got that Strutting Panther one big spot though, or are you on that turf. Well, uh, what, what, are, what are the thoughts? Is there, is there plans to eventually? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think know some of those. Yeah, yeah, some of those logos were are a little more challenging to to change out. Um, I think that that we're going to have to put in some plans. Um, you know, at least do some planning to replace that turf at, at O'Brien Field. Um, it's probably been there going on 12 years or so and and so that lifespan is probably um getting close so i think at that point in time is when we'll change that logo out in the middle but we're doing some graphic updates in lance um hopefully here sometime this fall um to um to really get the branding piece of it uh in lance on the graphics of the walls and things like that too i think i really like what you guys do with some of the podcasts i know rich you're involved in a lot of that talk about uh podcasts and where people can access that and all that we're able to get them a lot of different places apple podcast is the main place but then spotify stitcher soundcloud and i think iHeartRadio. i should know i spit those out every <laughs> week when i do them no but it's been good I mean, tom was one of our guests as we were down our, our season two he was our our guest to kick off year number two we will do about 50 of them during the year and, and it's good to kind of re-engage with with different alumni that have been here and, and kind of hear their stories a lot of times I think the alumni like talking about their experiences here. It helps them kind of relive some of those. But we have a lot of great stories of people that have gone on and done things very successfully, not always in athletics, a lot of times in other fields that are that are very interesting. And it, to me, doing the media relations and kind of being able to try to engage those stories and help us reconnect with some of those people, it's not always – when I'm calling you, hey, I want to, I want to, I want, write me a check. Yeah. Now, that would always be nice. As you, Tom <laughs> talked about, we, we, do, need, we, checks, we, yes. we do need resources to kind of do some of the things we want to do, but just to kind of re-engage with them. And I know when, when Tom talks, a lot of times we do the Hall of Fame. Some of those times we have those people come back that are being inducted. It's the first time they've been back since they played. And it's been five years. It's been 10 years. And our message to them is like this is your home you can always come back here and pop in and visit and say hi we're happy to show you around and this is just another way for us to kind of re- re-engage with those people. Jeff, I think I think to the podcast, and Rich deserves 100% of the credit for this, um, putting this together, but that's part of what COVID allowed us to do, too. That's when it kind of got started was, was in the COVID era, if you will, and um, the folks that Rich has been able to reach out to, engage with, and do that, it's, it's similar a little bit to linear TV, right? You guys probably deal with this. It's the streaming yeah. aspects of what it is and, and, and how many people people are plugging podcasts in when they're traveling in the car and listen to podcasts and different things like that. So, um, you know, you can, you can say, Hey, I want to listen to WEIU or I want to watch <laughs> WEIU on, the, but, but, but that's great, but there's also an audience out there that is podcast friendly, and Rich has certainly brought that to the department and, and done a phenomenal job with the number of guests that he's had on board. We're out of time. We're going to talk about whether who could outshoot Marty Marty Simmons or Marty <laughs> Marty. Just he put, said you, Tom. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, he's yeah. supposed to. Tom's the AD. So <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for coming in, guys. EIU Sports coming up. EIUPanthers.com for more information. Appreciate it, fellas. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.